my TMC family, join me today in the book of Romans as we begin this journey together of walking the Romans road. As we do here at the Mission Church of Lexington, we believe in expository preaching and teaching of God's Word where we work systematically verse by verse and chapter by chapter through the various books in the Bible. And we're beginning today in Romans chapter 1. We're going to read the first seven verses, but today's message is more of an introductory overview, a 30,000 foot view of this book that we'll be unpacking in minutia and in details and in a robust way over the coming, over the coming months, more or less. So Romans chapter 1, follow with me, beginning in verse 1 through verse 7. God's Word says this, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the Gospel of God, which He promised before through His prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, Beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are the very words of God from the book that we love. Amen. 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 As we launch together in this new sermon series in the book of Romans, I feel like 2 Corinthians 2.16 where it says, Who is sufficient for these things? The book that lays before us is a powerhouse of theological and doctrinal truth. That the book that we are about to study together has no uh, length and no depth to the weight that it carries. That I know that my feeble attempts to try to understand and communicate this will fall somewhat short. But I'm going to trust that the Holy Spirit of God will use the Word of God, will use the preaching of that Word, and allow the Holy Spirit of God inside of you to illuminate your understanding so that you can understand and apply these truths to your life. Romans 11.33 tells us this, The depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments, in His ways past finding out. What that says to me is that we can study God's Word for the rest of our life and just barely scratch the surface. Amen? That you will never run out of content when you're studying God's Word. Every time you read the Word of God, depending on where you are at in life, your age and your stage and your experience and the pain that you're under, it will speak in a fresh new way to you. I have read and I've studied and I've preached from this book many times over the years, but I'm learning fresh things now as I study it again. Amen? And I want it to be fresh and new to you. Not a novel concept. We're not looking for new things. We're looking to be reminded about the old things that are tried and true that if we just apply those to our lives, we can experience God's blessings. Amen? So we're going to look at this book that is full of deep and profound truths. Well, where did Paul get these kind of insights? Where did Paul get this spiritual understanding? In Galatians 1, 11 and 12, it says this. Paul says the information that he passes along, both verbally and written format, it was not given it to him by man. He did not learn it from a book. He did not have a teacher that passed it to him. He says, and it's a mighty claim, that he learned it from the Holy Spirit of God. 
that Jesus Himself communicated these truths to Paul to pass along to His original audience and has been preserved in God's Word for us today. Amen? Amen. We know that all of the writers of the Bible, there are about 40-some human authors, every one of them are uniquely inspired by God. That means God spoke to them and then spoke through them and then the Word of God has been preserved by the sovereignty and providence of God to the book that you hold before you today. We can know are the very words of God. When you open the Bible, God opens His mouth. So what we learn in this book from the Apostle Paul, we can take it to the bank. It is what God wants for us to know, to learn, and to live. But I will also admit, as Peter, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ Himself, in 2 Peter 3, 14-16, he says, you know that guy Paul? Some of his things are hard to understand. Amen? And I can say, I understand that feeling, Peter. Some of Paul's information, some of his doctrinal truths, they're hard to understand. But as has been said before by a man, it's not the parts of the Bible that, that I don't understand that gives me a hard, a hard time. It's the parts that I do understand and don't apply to my life. Amen? So we're going to learn this chapter and this book together. God has used this powerful letter. There's another word for letter, and it's the word epistle. Some people say, what is an epistle? I say, well, of course, it's the wife of an apostle. Amen? That's not what a, an epistle is. An epistle is a letter. It is a communication. And I want you to know that the uh, epistles in God's Word were meant to be read in entirety. That we're to read them from the verse 1 to the very last verse. Now we take them in sermons to, in bits and pieces and literary units, but I want you to know there's great power and there's great influence. We take a book like the book of Romans and you read it from beginning to end to understand the full concept of what the <laughs> author is trying to communicate to us. But God used this book, this epistle, in some remarkable ways throughout the history of the, the kingdom of God and the church. We know that St. Augustine may be the greatest theologian that mankind has ever experienced other than the great apostle Paul himself. He was, St. Augustine was converted through reading Romans 13, 13 and 14 where it says that he, we do not give any provision for the flesh, but we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know the testimony of St. Augustine, he was one who lived a very wayward life. That he was known in his younger years as a, a womanizer and a drunkard. That he had a good and faithful mama, her name was Monica, who would pray for him and would actually follow him around to all of his nefarious activities and would be telling him about God. Amen? And uh, finally, a mama's prayers came to fruition that God took this man to this book in the Bible, Romans chapter 13, and changed him. Made him a new creature in Christ. That when he heard the words of God, it wasn't just a uh, black print on white paper, but it seared into his heart, tattooed on his soul, and his life was changed. Friends, that's my prayer that this book will do in your life and my life as well. These truths will not just stick in your ear, but they will get down to your soul and get lived out into your life. But not only St. Augustine, but another church history hero of the past, Martin Luther, the great reformer, he launched that great movement of God that has changed the church as we know it by looking at Romans chapter 1, verse 17, where it says, The just shall live by faith. That in that day and time, there was lots of rituals and lots of rites and lots of legalistic things that had to be done for you to be considered right with God. 
And this great man thanked God for him who brought to light the reality that is through faith in the finished work of Christ that we have salvation. Now, once you have salvation, there is change in your life and some works follow, as James says, without works our faith is dead, but the works before our salvation accomplishes nothing. Trying to pay for our salvation with our good works would be equivalent to trying to pay your mortgage with some dryer lint. Amen? <laughs> no amount of dryer lint that you have can pay your mortgage payment. You have a whole dump truck full and the bank is not going to take it. Amen? Same thing is true for our good works. You can have a dump truck full of your good works, but it doesn't earn salvation until you trust in Jesus Christ by faith and then all the good works matter after that. But we learn that primarily through this book of the Bible, illuminated by Martin Luther. Let's jump forward a little further in Christian history. There's a man named John Wesley. He is the founder of the Methodist movement. He was converted by listening to someone reading Luther's commentary on Romans. Can you imagine just me coming up here and reading a commentary to you and it does something inside of your heart and your soul? Well, that's what happened to John Wesley. He just heard another man reading the commentary of Luther who I just spoke about who wanted to communicate the truths that God revealed to him to generations to come. And John Wesley had said his heart was strangely warmed. That there was a changing from the inside out, not the outside in. That kind of reminds me in, in the last chapter of the book of Luke about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus where Jesus is walking with them and talking with them. And they look at each other and say, our hearts were warmed when he was talking to us about the word of God. And he says, what God's word can do. You can come here today with a, a hard heart and a stiff neck, but God's Word can soften that heart. It can warm that heart. It can loosen those neck muscles, not physically, but spiritually, and make you pliable in the hands of God. Only His Word can do that. It doesn't matter how I get up here and try to give you passion and try to give you energy and try to be a little bit humorous and try to be able to do my very best in my public presentation. Only God's Word can do the change inside of you that only God wants to do. Amen? Amen. The Swiss commentator uh, Godet said this, Every great spiritual revival in the church will be connected as effect and cause with a deeper understanding of this book. He gave a lot of credence to this book in the Bible. And his uh, assumption, every past, every present, every future revival will be based on the understanding of this great book. I agree in one sense, but I disagree in another. I don't know my, my experience and my study of revivals tells me the impetus for revival is always repentance and prayer. Amen? That repentance, turning from our sin and pouring out our hearts to God in honest and genuine prayer is what leads to revival. God's Word just studied doesn't typically create revival inside of us. I have met lots of people with seminary degrees, even in seminary classrooms, that are spiritually dry. Amen? But whenever you take God's Word, you apply it to your life, you let the Holy Spirit of God ignite that flame, which results in witnessing as well as worshiping, then you are going to experience revival. Amen. Friends, that's what revival is. It's when God's people return to God. Amen? That's what a revival is. A revival really isn't for unbelievers. Revival is for believers. Those of us who know better, we get revived. 
There was a time where we were on fire and for some reason that spiritual fire began to flicker and we need that spiritual inferno to burn again. Amen. Now there's a mighty time where unbelievers get saved. That real term for that's not revival. That is a re an awakening. Amen. An awakening. People were a dead or they were asleep spiritually and they're being brought to life. They are woken to the truth of God. That's the only kind of woke just we like as believers, amen. To be awoken to the Spirit of God and the truth of the gospel. Amen. But I'm praying that this book, as Godet says, as we mix this book through the coming months with prayer, with repentance, with a heart turned to God, that there will be a revival in this church. Amen. Amen. That there will be a revival in your heart. That there will be a revival in your family. That there will be a revival in your ministry that God has given you. That there would be a revival in our community. That there would be a revival in our state. That there would be a revival in our country. And it might all begin right here, right now, at the Mission Church of Lexington as we do a deep dive, honest Bible study of the book of Romans. Real revival in the church begins with real repentance within the Christians. That's our call today. This book is the most complete and logical presentation of Christian truth in the entire Bible. If a Bible student wishes to master only one book of the Bible, let it be the book of Romans. Hey, I have a favorite book in the Bible. My personal favorite is the book of Acts. Now, I'll be honest, i got 67 other favorite books too. Amen. <laughs> but, but if I was stranded on an island, I could only have one book of the Bible, could not have any of the other books, only one, my choice would be, and I hope it will be your choice, it would be the book of Romans. It gives us a complete understanding of God's plan, God's purpose, God's meaning, and God's direction. This book is key to unlocking the rest of the Word of God. Why? Three reasons. Number one, it presents doctrinal truth. It talks about justification, sanctification, adoption, judgment, our identity in Christ. These are doctrinal issues. Some people look at doctrine as a bad word. Well, I don't want doctrine. I just want Jesus. The problem is you can't have Jesus without doctrine. Doctrine simply means the things you believe. Amen? And your doctrine matters because your belief matters. It's been said what man or woman thinks about God is the most important thing about that man or woman. So what you believe about God really matters. That we don't want to worship a God created in a figment of our imagination. We don't want to worship a God that's created by someone else's stories. We want to know the true and living God of God's Word. Amen? Amen. And our doctrine matters. Yes. Not only does it present doctrinal truth, it presents uh, dispensational truth. What is that, Pastor Donovan? It shows how the relationship between Israel and the church, how they work together in the eternal plan of God. That's going to be some, uh, we'll, be, we'll be in some high cotton there, friends. When we get to those chapters in the book of uh, Romans, there's some heavy spiritual lifting there, but God's going to show us some powerful things. We talk about God's chosen people, the nation of Israel, and how God has for a time set them aside, not abandoned them, has not done away with them, but set aside for the, the church, the church age we're in now, but Jesus is not done with the Jews. Amen. Amen. We're going to talk about that together. So not only doctrinal truths and dispensational truths, but also presents de developmental truths. It talks about discipleship, how to have victory over the flesh, our Christian duties toward others, even our relationship with the government. We'll talk about some pretty practical things. Paul, many times in his epistles, he would start with theory and end with practice. He would begin with doctrine and then he would end with deeds. 
Again, that's the picture of the Christian life. It's not just about filling our mind with new Bible trivia. It's not just knowing more about God. That's where it begins, conforming your mind instead of being conformed to the world, right? But then it needs to work out into our life. Our beliefs must turn into our behaviors. That if Jesus is in your life, change happens. Why? Because everything Jesus touches changes. And if you are not changed, you may not be touched. Amen? So let's take a very quick ascent up Mount Perspective and see the panoramic view of this book in the Bible. Okay, in your outline... I gave you a brief outline. You'll be happy to know. I'm not going to preach all these today. I'm not going to read all these verses today. But these give you an outline of this entire book that we will be walking through together over the coming weeks. First one is the salutation. It's simply the howdy. How are you doing? The hello. The beginning. Next week we will be unpacking together these first seven verses. It's amazing. All those seven verses in, in our English Bible is one long verse in the Greek. <laughs> that Paul begins and that gets carried away. He's so excited about what he's talking about. The gospel and salvation. This pen just can't stop. Amen. He keeps writing and writing and writing. And Paul is known for his long sentences. When I know for my long sins are called run on sentences. But Paul has a good grammar and he's able to be able to pack so much in a few verses. We'll study that next week. That's a salutation. The next thing we'll learn in this book is about sin. We'll see that in uh, chapter 18 all the way through chapter 3, verse 20. We're going to learn that sin is detestable in God's sight. That sin is not something that we should make a pet. That it's something that we should see the way God sees it. That sin separates us from a holy God. It's sin that always leads to sorrow and suffering and spiritual death. It's this is the, the heart of all of our problems is our sin that is our case positionally as well as practically. That we are sinners by birth and sinners by choice. There's nothing that we can do to fix the grounded and rooted and DNA, if you will, sin inside of us. Only God can do the radical, dramatic renovation inside of us to make us a new creature. And even the outside sin, we can try to white knuckle it for a while, have a New Year's resolution, you know, be able to, to try really hard and have more discipline, and that may get you a little bit, but soon you will go back to your old ways apart from what Jesus can do in our lives. Amen? We'll learn at length about that in sin. Number three, salvation. Hey, this part's fun, amen? We learn about God's saving work, that we were dead in our sins and Jesus made us alive. We'll learn about salvation having a different aspects. So do you know that you are saved, but you're also <laughs> being saved? You were saved from your sin in the past, you're being saved from your sin in the present, and one day you'll be saved from your sin in the future. We are saved from the penalty of sin in the past. You raise that white flag of surrender when God sees you. He sees the shed blood of Christ that you may not forget your sins. Other people may hold your sins against you, but God has made a decision to bury your sin in the grave of His forgetfulness. Amen? We In the past, the, the penalty of sin in the presence, He wants to give us salvation over the power of sin. Did you know that you don't have to sin? We will sin because we fall prey to the sin, the, the flesh, the world, and the devil. But you don't have to sin, as John says in 1 John, because the Spirit of God's inside of you. And if you're yielded to the Spirit of God, you can live a life that is pleasing to the Lord. But as soon as you sin, so you step out of obedience in the Lord and the Holy Spirit, there's where sin comes into play. Amen? We also learn that in the future there will be a time where we are saved from the presence of sin. So from the, from the penalty, from the power, and the presence. Sanctification, justification, glorification. One day we will be in heaven, amen, where there will be no more tears, there will be no more sadness, and there will be no more sin. We are not yet there, amen. 
We are still here. The promise of salvation is not just for the sweet by and by, but it's also for the nasty now and now. That God wants us to be able to live a little piece of heaven on earth even now. Salvation. Number four, sanctification. Sanctification is progressive discipleship. Incremental growth. We talk about here at the Mission Church taking your next spiritual step of obedience. That you're either walking with the Lord and you're progressing, or as we learn in the Bible, you are backsliding. Amen? It's one or the other. You may not be sprinting forward right now, though God would want you to, but you should be moving forward. Amen? You should be growing more in love with the Lord. You should be having the Lord captivate more of your life. And the result of that is that you're, you're in the Word more, that you're praying more, that you're sharing more, but not just those things that are religious activities because you're loving Jesus so much. These things are not just a duty for you, but they're a delight. Amen? Sanctification and maturity and spiritual growth is what God desires for all of us. One of the saddest things you will see is if you walked into a church and you walked into the nursery and you looked at the crib in the nursery and it's beautiful and it's all frilly and little stuffed animals and you have the mobile up there. You look down and see that beautiful, cute little baby, the little toes and little fat legs, little pop belly. It's crazy. My wife thinks little babies with bellies are cute, but not me. I don't know what that's about. But then you look and they got an adult head. Wouldn't that be pretty grotesque? Yeah. A little baby with an adult head? There's a lot of Christians that are that way. whole lot up here, but there's not been spiritual growth. In far too many churches, there are more spiritual preemies in the worship center than in the nursery. We need to have growth, amen? You can evaluate your life. Where were you a year from now? Where are you now? Where do you want to be a year from now? Just as you have goals for your family, for your retirement, for your vocation, you should have some goals for your spiritual life. Amen? Some holy habits. Some spiritual disciplines. Some, some goals that you want to attain because if you aim at nothing, you will hit it every time. Amen? Some people have, some Christians have uh, 20 years of experience in growth, while other Christians have uh, one year of experience 20 times. <laughs> They're doing the same thing, and, and it's really irreproachable in the gospel. When you talk to somebody, you know, in the next year, or five years, or ten years from now, and they're in the same spiritual condition. They're, they're struggling with the very same uh, shortcomings and, and strongholds and strangleholds in their life that they already received counsel on. They, they, they pray for it and they try to do the things, but they're still just not moving. Because I want you to know that the gospel of God wants to free us from those things. Amen. John says, you shall know the truth and truth shall set you free. Amen. When Jesus makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Paul says in Galatians, you have received freedom for the sake of freedom. It is what you're living under bondage. It is what you be under your circumstances. He wants you to be on top of them because you are more than conquerors in Christ. Next one is sovereignty. And this will be a little bit of a recap for you guys because we just finished, finished many weeks talking about the invisible hand of God, God's sovereignty, God's providential movement, God's invisible hand, the glove of human history. And that's true in every facet of our life, but it is certainly true in these doctrines of grace, in these, this message about sin and salvation and sanctification. God's sovereignty is center stage. We don't choose God as much as God chooses us. Amen? That, that God is the initiator, but we have to be the responder. That God doesn't force anybody to follow Him or to love Him or to serve Him, but we could not do it without Him, but He will not do it without us. Amen? That He invites you. He doesn't force you, but you have to know it's all because of God. You would not have chose God in your own broken, sinful state, but because the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Then lastly, service. And here's where we get very practical. 
We talk about here at the Mission Church, every member should be a minister. Every member should be a missionary. That the Christian life church is not a spectator sport. That God wants you to be involved. He wants you to be engaged. He wants you to use your one and only life to serve Him. Every Christian here has received at least one spiritual gift from the Holy Spirit. Probably many more. You do not want to waste that gift. You don't want to waste that uh, experience you have. You don't want to waste your life. You want to invest it and use your life to serve God to your very last day. All right. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this for the next 15 minutes before we're done. Romans was written by Paul while he was ministering in Corinth. We're reading about this day in this uh, city of antiquity in Acts chapter 20. We learn that wherever Paul goes, there is either a revival or a revolt. Amen? That, that wherever he went, he preached the gospel. That wherever he went, he sought intentionally to proclaim truth. And whenever God's Word is proclaimed, there's going to be a response. Same is true today. When you share the gospel with somebody, some people will get mad, some people will get glad, some people will get sad. Amen? There's always going to be a response. We say every week at the time of our response that the gospel has been preached and it now demands a response. The same happened for this man, Apostle Paul, community-wise and individuals. In Acts 20, we find him in, in Corinth a major city in that day. And it was from there that he wrote this letter to Rome. Paul indicates he was with a couple ministry associates while he was there in Corinth. Romans 16.23 says this, Gaius, my host and the host of the whole church, greet you. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greet you. And Cortus, a brother. Now you'll know from Paul, he's a name dropper. <laughs> he was not only a soul winner, but he was a friend maker. Amen? He knew that the power of evangelism, the power of ministry, the power of influence always crosses over the bridge of relationships. So Paul built many relationships and he would speak about them often throughout his epistles. It shows us again that even if you are a spiritual juggernaut as the Apostle Paul, you need other brothers and sisters of Christ. Amen? God created us for community. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. Even the Lone Ranger needed Tonto. Amen? That, that we need one another and Paul understood that. Well, these guys he listed off. We learn in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 14, I thank God that I baptize none of you except Crispus and Gaius. There's that name Gaius. He was a man that he referred to in Romans that he also had referred to in the book of 1 Corinthians where he wrote this letter from. This other guy named Erastus. We see his name appear again in 2 Timothy 4.20. Erastus stayed in Corinth but Trophimus I have left in Miletus sick. Now this is a side note. This is a sidebar. But uh, I think it preaches well. Here we see the great Apostle Paul. Nobody had more faith and more knowledge of God. He had a buddy named Trophimus. And he had to leave him in Miletus sick. If it was always God's will to heal every one of us every time spiritually and physically, would he have left a friend there sick? Hey, sometimes God's will is bigger than our temporary sicknesses. Amen? Sometimes the healing that God has for us is not on this side of eternity. There is a, uh, a bad spin in the Christian world in this area where you say, if you just had enough faith, then you would be healed. Or if you send enough money in and, the, and this uh, charlatan is able to give you a handkerchief that he blew his nose in or something, then you will be healed. Friends, those things are not scriptural and they are not biblical. God can heal. We're going to pray for healing. We're going to lay hands on people. We're going to anoint people. And God does that sometimes. Amen? But sometimes He doesn't. And it's not always because of a lack of faith doesn't always mean there is sin in someone's life. It can mean that, but it doesn't always mean that. 
Sickness and sorrow and death are part of the human experience. And here he says, my buddy, Trophimus, I'm sure he prayed for Trophimus to be healed. I'm sure he wanted Trophimus to be healed. But when he left that city of Corinth, he had to leave his buddy behind and Miletus sick. Hey, this letter, Romans, this epistle, was probably carried to Rome from Corinth by a woman named Phoebe. Now, we have a Phoebe in our church, and we love her, but here is the Bible character Phoebe. Romans 16.1 says this, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church of Centuria. She likely lived in Centuria, which was a seaport, kind of a suburb of Corinth. We learn in Acts 18, verse 18. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centuria, for he had taken a vow. See, that's why it's biblical to have bald preachers. Amen. <laughs> Paul shaved his hair off in Centuria. And that is where he met Phoebe. And that's where we learn that she took this letter to the Romans as recorded in Romans 16.1. Paul mentioned a couple other close friends. In her names, Aquila and Priscilla. Romans 16.3 says this, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. And this was a husband and wife team who were originally residing in Rome. Paul met them when they were in Corinth. Many Bible scholars say there was probably a mini persecution. So they were religious refugees who came from Rome to have a safe abode in Corinth. And as soon as it calmed down a little bit, they now went back and they were now being a witness back in Rome. And they were friends of Paul. It's just kind of an application. Here you have a husband and wife who are a mighty servants for God. Amen? Hey, we can have a great witness for God in our marriages. That God wants to use our married life, husbands and wives, together, being better together than they would be alone. Amen? If you are single here, not yet married, divorced, widowed, God still wants to use your life. No doubt about it. There's not one person that is a second thought to God and God is not uh, surprised by your circumstances, but there is a powerful testimony and ability for God to use a husband and wife who are on fire for Him in step with one another and serving God. God together. Amen? Amen? Goes on to say this in Acts 18 too. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, probably when that persecution took place, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. So under Claudius, there was a minor persecution, not the, the overall persecution that comes later, but probably a small skirmish. They left, and then they went back when it was a little more safe to do so. Big question, church family. How did there come to be a group of believers in Rome? There doesn't appear to be an organized church at this point, but a scattering of believers. Paul doesn't address the letter to the church in Rome, which he does in many of his other letters, but rather he says to all who are in Rome. For example, Romans 1 7 says this to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So it looks like potentially there were believers in Rome, but there hasn't been an, an organizing, there hasn't been a, an establishing of an identifiable congregation of believers. Throughout the book, we seem to see different disconjointed subgroups. Romans 16.5 says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved uh, Epaptus, who is the first fruits of Acacia. Romans 16 says, Greet Apellus, approved of God. Greet those who are of the household of Aristobulus. 
Romans 16, where he lists a bunch of different names. It seemed like these people maybe had not formed a nucleus, a, a synergistic work of God. They were more disconnected. And Paul had a desire to bring them together for more effective evangelistic and ministry purposes. Friends, this is one reason why I enjoy being a Southern Baptist. Amen? We have lots of faults and lots of flaws, but we work well together to advance the Gospel. Amen? Amen. We can do more together than we can do alone. Yeah. We can do more in partnership than we can try to do on our own. It's a beautiful picture. And Paul, I believe, had this on his heart. Now, one tradition that lacks historical scriptural foundation is that the church in Rome, again, it doesn't look like there's really a church yet, a scattering of believers, but they will say the church in Rome was founded by Peter. It is claimed that Peter lived there for some 25 years, but this cannot be validated or proven. If Peter had started the work in Rome, then certainly there would have been an organized church rather than a scattering of believers. Additionally, Paul greeted many friends in Rome, like in chapter 16, but he doesn't mention Peter. It was Paul's practice to read spiritual leaders in other letters. So logic would tell us that if Peter had already been there and was doing a work there, that Paul would have acknowledged this great apostle of the faith. But probably the most um, telling argument that says that Peter did not start the church in Rome was from Romans 15.20 where Paul says this, I have made it my aim to preach the gospel not where Christ was already named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. He was, a, he was a pioneer. He wasn't a settler. He wanted to go where there was not already churches established and to establish a church for the furtherance of the gospel. Paul was anxious to minister to the saints in Rome. Paul would not have made these plans if another apostle had already started a work there. So then how and why do our Catholic friends hold Peter as the founder of the church in Rome? Well, it comes from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 18. It says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, this was the farthest north He ever went from His hometown. You know, Jesus has changed the world. Amen? But He only traveled in less than a 100 mile radius from where He was born. This was the furthest north He had ever traveled as far as we know from Scripture. He asked His disciples saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man I am. So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Those are all good, but not good enough. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And friends, that's the most important question you can ever answer in your life. Who do you say Jesus is? Simon Peter, often the unofficial spokesman of the disciples, he opened his mouth and said this. Oftentimes he opened his mouth, he put his foot in it, but not here. He got it right this time. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And this was a divine understanding, but my Father is in heaven. But I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 18, here's the secret sauce right here. Here's where cats would say, well look, Jesus built the church upon Peter. My understanding, and I have a lot of other good scholars that would agree, and I hope that you see it this way as well. It says this, I say your name is Peter, but upon this rock, lowercase r in the New King James, not talking about Peter the person, but talking about Peter's message. On the statement that Jesus is the Son of God, on that proclamation, on the right identification of who Jesus is, that is what God will build His church upon. Not upon a man, but upon a message. So how then did the gospel get to Rome? In my sanctified imagination, it took place on the day of Pentecost. 
Remember the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2? It says that people from all over the known world had come to Jerusalem for that holiday. And while they were there, they experienced something they never experienced before. The Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples and Peter became a, a preaching with power. And it says that he preached the gospel in a way that all these different people with all their different dialects understood it. And guess what the natural thing is for people who hear the gospel? They go back to wherever they were from, forever changed with this message. And it became a progression of carrying the baton of faith. There are people from Rome who were in Pentecost, in Jerusalem, Pentecost. They got saved and they took the message back home. Amen? Seems simple enough to me. Another way the people got there to Rome. Gentile Christian converts all over the Roman known world at that time by Paul. They would travel to and from, and Rome was like the, the center of, a, uh, of a, a wagon wheel. All roads lead to Rome. You've heard that saying before, right? That, that everybody passed through Rome at some different time, especially merchants, and especially dignitaries, and especially soldiers. And as they were saved in other places like Corinth and Athens and New Antioch, as they were being saved in all these places, they would carry the message back to the capital that day, to Rome. So I want you to see there that God uses not only the pros, but the Joes. Amen? He used the pros, people like Paul and Peter, these great men to take the Gospel. But we see throughout the, the book of Acts and other places that it's, it's the Joes, often unnamed people who carry the Gospel to their family, their friends, and their communities. They share and they show the Gospel and lives are changed. And God is on the move. What message did they take? Romans 1, 16 and 17 in the front of your worship bulletin. This will be our theme two verses as we go through the sermon series. It says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Gentile. For it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Let me give you one last illustration. There was an old couple. They'd been together for many years, but they had never gotten married. They lived together in the cohabitation relationship for year after year after year. Well, one day, the man looked over to his aging, cohabitating female friend and said, I got an idea. Let's get married. The old lady said, That is a great idea. But who would have us now? <laughs> Friends, I want you to know, Christ will have you. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter your intellectual level, your physical looks. It doesn't matter your bank account, your education. It doesn't matter your age and stage in life. Christ will have you. He wants you. He's pursued you. Just as He took the Gospel to Rome, He's taken the Gospel to you today. The question is, have you responded? And if not, are you ready to respond?